Hi, everybody. My name's Johnny, and I'm an alcoholic. I, uh, I'm glad to be here this morning, and I'm, I'm glad to be sober. I, uh, I never quite been introduced that way before that I remember. Uh, well, yes, I have, too. It's what I was handed from the Los Angeles County Sheriff to the Department of Corrections in the state of California. They said, here's not law. Keep him for a few years to see if you can help him. But I am glad to be here this morning, and I'm glad to be sober. I'm glad to be a part of the second ever Huntsville Roundup, and I, I'd like to thank the people for uh, the extreme privilege I have of participating in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. I don't know how you feel about it, but uh, I have never been able to get over the idea that it's some type of a privilege to be allowed to come and sit in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I pray God as long as I live and I'm able to breathe in and out that I never get an idea in my head that I have a right to be here just because I don't drink alcohol anymore. I hope as long as I'm able to stand up and breathe in and out that I always think it's a privilege to come and sit with you good people. Because I don't know how you feel about it, but something happens to me in Alcoholics Anonymous meetings that don't happen to me anywhere else. That's why I go to so many of them. I guess uh, what I'm trying to say is that if you're new here in Alcoholics Anonymous this morning, I hope and pray to God that the word being sober doesn't offend you as bad as it offended me when I came to my first meeting. So I said in my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous on a Sunday morning on the fourth day of November, 1959. And I sat in there and I sat in the back row and where I lovingly like to call my throne of contempt and I didn't know what Alcoholics Anonymous was. And I sit there and the people of Alcoholics Anonymous talked to me that day about being sober. And I didn't think Alcoholics Anonymous had anything to offer me. And the reason I didn't think that is because I was as physically sober when I came to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous as I am right now. I haven't had a drink or a pill or a token joint, have stuck any heroin in my arm from that meeting to this one. And not because I'm any great magical rocket to stardom or anything. It's just because I was all through when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and didn't know it. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous without the slightest clue of what was wrong with me. I had never been called an alcoholic. Nobody had ever mentioned that word to me. I had never heard of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was nowhere in my repertoire if I'd ever been come. Matter of fact, if I'd have known where I was coming that day, I wouldn't have come. <laughs> And I, it's really true, if, if, if you'd have stood at the door of that meeting that day with a lie detector test and asked me one simple question, are you an alcoholic, I'd have said, no, I'm not, and the needle would not have moved. I'm like a lot of people who come to Alcoholics Anonymous, I'd have the slightest idea what an alcoholic was, not at all. But I knew all about whiskey. I knew more about whiskey when I was six years old as I know right now. Everybody in my family drank whiskey. They made it, they sold it, and they drank it. And they do what people like that do when they drink whiskey. They gather up on Saturday and have little family gatherings. Now, my family were all Irish, and they were mad because they weren't Catholic. <laughs> I think they were just mad in here. They gather up, they drank each other's whiskey, they stole each other's women, they beat each other up. Just a regular little Irish get-together on the weekend. <laughs> and whoever survived, I suppose, was the king for the week. I don't know how they worked here, little deep. But I understood that, strange as it may seem. Even when I didn't know what I was understanding, I understood violence. It seemed it's some kind of a nature of mine to understand violence. I'd see them beat each other up. I could understand knocking somebody down and kicking them in the gut. You know what I mean? Stepping on them and doing all that kind of stuff kind of makes you have a spiritual experience kind of feeling inside. <laughs> I even get to feel like that sometimes today. I wouldn't mind doing a little that every once in a while. Just What I never was able to understand was how these same people who did that to one another on Saturdays and Sundays would gather up on Wednesdays and say things like, we love one another because we're family. I've never been able to understand that. 
Now, I guess I said to myself, if that's what love is, you can keep it. Because I never uttered that word in my life to any human being before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and for a long time after I was here. It wasn't in my vocabulary. I thought to myself, if that's what family is, you can keep them. I don't like these people. I don't want to be around these people. But I had some type of a strange feeling inside of me that I didn't understand. It's a restlessness and an irritability, I guess, and anger. Oh, God, I was angry. I was mad at everything. And my madness was not just a slight case of temper tantrums. It was a violent rage that I lived with all my life. And I didn't know what was going on, and I wanted a way out of this situation because I knew that was wrong. I knew it was wrong to feel that way and to think that way. And don't ask me how I knew it. I just knew it. And I didn't want to feel that way. Because I looked at my brother, and he didn't feel that way. He didn't look that way. He didn't act that way. And I looked at a lot of people around here, and they didn't look that way and feel that way. So I started looking for a way out of this deal. And I looked up one day, and there stood my grandmother. Now, my grandmother lived but she was 90 years old. She never took a drink of alcohol or smoked a cigarette in her life. So Grandma wouldn't think it was a big deal. But I haven't had none for over 30. Really, she'd say. But I looked at Grandma, and Grandma would get up on Sunday morning, like this Sunday morning. She'd step over the bodies in her home, put on her best dress, and disappear for about two hours. Three hours, maybe. And she'd come back, and something had happened to Grandma. Now, I didn't know what had happened to Grandma, but when she got back, Grandma was walking a little easier. Grandma was smiling a little more. Grandma had some type of a glow about her, and Grandma was singing songs to Jesus in the kitchen. Now, I took a look at that. Now, my grandpa would leave on Thursdays, <clears throat> and he'd come back on Tuesdays. And sometimes we'd have to go get him. And Grandpa would come back in all various shapes. One time, Grandpa came back on a wagon, laid out. He'd been shot and stabbed and thrown off the second floor balcony of a whorehouse in Kansas City. And I took a look at that. And I figured Grandma's got the best deal. Keen alcoholic mind. Isn't that amazing? The only people who talk about the keen alcoholic mind are the alcoholics. You never hear the al talking about the keen alcoholic mind. If they do, they refer to us in such intellectual terms as the keen alcoholic got up last night and peed in the linen closet. <laughs> so I decided, with all of my intelligence, that I should go where Grandma goes and do what Grandma does. I'd be like Grandma. But I didn't figure on very, one very simple little thing, that wherever I went, I went. And wherever I went, the problem went. I took those feelings with me inside my grandmother's church. And I sat in my grandmother's church alongside of my grandmother. And I looked at my grandmother and something happened to my grandmother sitting in that church. Something happened to the people sitting around my grandmother in that church that day, but nothing happened to me. Nothing. I was just installed with a little more guilt and anxiety because the guy said I was supposed to love and honor and respect my parents, and I did, not I hated them. And I don't know what's going on in this situation, and I'm, in a, I'm about to the end of my rope because I don't know what's going on. And one day, sitting on the back porch of my grandfather's house, I watched my grandfather stash his jug. And when Grandpa left, I went to his jug. Something I said I'd never do, because I saw what whiskey did to people. But I took a drink of alcohol that day, and in the next couple of minutes of my life is what I've come to understand is what makes me an alcoholic. Not the next 20 years of mayhem I created on the world out there and the people around me, but because of this seemingly unnatural abnormal reaction to alcohol that I seem to have. That everybody who drinks it doesn't have it, which Bob explained last night. Something happens to me when I drink alcohol that doesn't happen to everybody that drinks it. Alcohol has the unnatural effect to go down inside of me and still the screaming madness. 
It takes me from the black pit of nothingness and stands me into the gray fringes of the business of living. It installs in me some type of arrogance. It says, damn you, world, it's all right. I'm not good enough to be around the good people, but I'm too good to be around the bad people. And the most amazing thing that alcohol ever did to me, it just turned off that switch in my head that said, I don't care. I just don't care. That alone is a type of experience that I had with alcohol. But the thing that literally drove me into the gates of insanity and death was not the reaction I got from alcohol, but trying to overcome this tremendous phenomenon of craving develops once I take a drink of alcohol inside of me. Once I take a drink of alcohol, I can't quit drinking. I have never been able to quit drinking. I can stand right here this morning and tell you I haven't had a drink of alcohol or a mood altering chemical of any nature in my system since the fourth day of November, 1959, and to this instant I have not quit drinking. I don't know how to quit drinking. I've always had to be stopped from drinking. Left to my own devices, I destroyed myself before I was nine years old. I don't know how. A guy asked me the other day, and he said, how do you quit drinking? I don't know how. What do you think? I said, hit a cop in the mouth. <laughs> Jesus, they look at you with strange things when you talk about that. That's not a psychological answer anymore. He said, what will that do for me? I said, I'd get you stopped for about three days. After that, you're on your own. I didn't know. What happened to me when I drank alcohol happened to me every time I drank alcohol. Every time. It wasn't just a one-time phenomenon. I took a drink of alcohol, and three days later, I was pulled out from underneath a bridge and stood in front of a judge and sentenced to the Hutchison State Reform School. Twenty years later, I took a drink of alcohol. They stood me in front of a judge in Compton and sentenced me to 20 years in the penitentiary. That's what happened to me. When I drank, I got drunk and went places. <laughs> I traveled around out there. I went from reform school to reform school to junior penitentiaries to penitentiaries to nut houses. Now they call them treatment centers. I kind of like nut house a little better myself. A little more macho. I mean, if you're going to be bad, you ought to be bad. You know what I mean? You shouldn't quit drinking because you puke a little. Hang in there. I don't know where this nonsense comes from that you hear people talk about alcoholics anonymous all the time. Well, if you don't believe you're an alcoholic, go to 90 meetings in 90 days. You know what the book says? If you don't believe you're alcoholic, go drink. That, I can't think of a better way to prove it to you. There's something about a good old-fashioned ass-kicking that gets your attention. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I, when I'm a kid, when I first went into, into juvenile hall in Los Angeles, I'm scared, I'm petrified, I'm a blue-eyed devil in a sea of Mexicans, and I don't know what to do. And so I found out, I went up to the guy and I said, who's the baddest man in this place? Or the baddest, well, we call it men, we were only kids. He told me, oh, so-and-so. So the next day, first opportunity, I went up and challenged him. He damn near beat me to death. He put me in the hospital. As soon as I got out of the hospital, I went back and got him again. But he got me again. That went on three times. And the third time, I got the idea. He ain't ever going to get a chance to do that again. And if he walked in this room right now, I would run up to him and say, Hi, sir, would you like a cup of coffee? I ain't never forgot him at all. But you see, by the time that happened, I had my reputation established. People thought I was crazy. I was crazy. I mean, you take three beatings like I took, you would be crazy. <laughs> Just to prove that you belong somewhere. That you fit in there. That you do anything that anybody asks you to do just so they know you're there. It's the way I live my life. I'm sitting on a furlough from reform school, and I'm, I don't know, 10 or 11 years old, I'm drinking a bottle of Marco Petri red wine, which seemed to be my drink. Unlike some people, I started on bad wine and worked down. <laughs> well, I tell you, I tell you a little story. You remember Rochelle yesterday talking about how she was driving from Atlanta to Callaway Gardens from the darkness to the light? I was at that conference. I came in after her. 
And when I got into my room that night, I turned on the television set and found out there was a tornado following me down the road. <laughs> I wonder what kind of significance that is. I just... <laughs> See, I'm sitting on the street corner, I'm drinking this wine, and it ain't quite doing what I want it to do. Now, I want to emphasize that to you very, very clearly. You hear a lot of times in Alcoholics Anonymous, alcohol quit working. Ain't never quit working at me. I know what takes the big herd away. I know exactly what it's right here. Right here. I know what takes it away. And I know it will take it away. That's why I still have to go to meetings. I don't have a craving for alcohol or an obsession to drink, but that knowledge sits back there. It's immovable in my life. I know what takes away the big hurt. See, it just wasn't taking me where I wanted it to take me. That's what I'm trying to tell you. See, I've always wanted to be gone somewhere. I never wanted to be here. I wanted to be gone somewhere. And so I'm sitting there and this stuff ain't doing it, and the guy looked at me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, try these. And he gave me some pills. Now, I don't remember saying to him, what are those? Will they bother me if I take them? <laughs> I just took them. As Papa used to say, T-double-O-K took. Thank God they weren't X-lax, that's all I can tell you. <laughs> Hell, I could be standing here today as the adult child of a laxative taker. <laughs> I would have been functional, but mother sat on the toilet all the time when I was late. <laughs> Worked all I can tell you. A couple of years later, on that same street corner, on a further from another reform school, I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm drinking this wine and I'm eating these pills and they don't seem to be working, doing what they're supposed to be doing, and a guy stuck a needle in my arm. And for the next 14 years of my life, I stuck needles in my arm and ran in and out of institutions. That's what I do. So I live out in the streets, and I do what people who live in the streets do. I destroy everything that comes in contact with me. I'm like a plague out there. And the reason I do that is I'm a taker. I'm a taker of things, and I'm a user of people, so therefore I'm a loser. I'm selfish, I'm self-centered, and I'm self-serving, and i got an ego bigger than this whole room. My entire lifetime was spent before I came here to you good people. And for a long time after I was here, without a conscious thought or a conscious concern for any other human being who lived upon the face of this earth, I was not interested in you at all. If you had something I wanted, I may have simulated some type of interest until I got whatever it was you had that I wanted. Then I cast you aside and went on about my business. I never told anybody I loved them. Love to me was a sign of weakness. Where I grew up, in the neighborhood I grew up, and the people I run with, weaknesses was your death sentence. That's why I live my life. Show weakness, you're gone. So I never said that. If I told you I loved you, you're going to be able to use me. And I never put myself in that position. If you lived like that for any period of time like I did, maybe the same thing will happen to you that happened to me. 35 years ago or so. I came to crawling around in a cell in solitary confinement at a maximum security penitentiary drifting in and out of total insanity. What's significant about that to me is that there wasn't a single solitary soul left upon the face of this earth who would send me a penny postcard. There wasn't anybody left. I'd used them all up. They were gone. But they should be gone. And I had no right whatsoever to have them back. And I still have no right to have anything back. I do not have rights at all. If I had rights, I would exercise them and demand them. And I look around in the world and see what rights being demanded creates. And I'm glad I don't have any. I have privileges, but I do not have rights. And I can abuse the privileges. I learned that in Alcoholics Anonymous. And where I grew up, in the air I grew up, there was no such thing as rights. You didn't have any. You survived, but you did not have any right to survive. It was the law of the jungle. One eats one. One destroys the other one. 
The strong survive and the weak perish was our cry. Do I live my life? So what happened to me on that Sunday in November when I stumbled into you? I don't know. I believe it's an answer to prayer. Not my mother's prayers. Not my aunt's prayers. Not anybody else's prayer. It's the answer to a prayer that I'd made in a deathbed a year previous to that in the Los Angeles County Jail when I was sentenced to die by the medical profession. I lay in that bed for 18 days and 18 nights. I didn't eat, sleep, drink, or anything. I was 128 pounds and I was yellow and I was supposed to die. Doctor told me I was going to die. And I wanted to die. I was through and didn't know I was through. And one night out of sheer desperation, I said, oh, God, help me. That's all. And the most amazing thing I know about that is this morning as I was reading my 24-hour day book, which I read every day, it said somewhere in there this morning it was significant to me that God hears prayer that comes from the heart. It's been my experience sitting in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous that every time I've ever seen anybody, I've known anybody who's ever stayed sober in Alcoholics Anonymous for any length of time whatsoever, with any degree of happiness, has always made that prayer of desperation somewhere in their life. Oh, God, help me. It's amazing to me. Now, I sit in that room, and I looked at what I looked at, and there'd be nowhere in the world I could figure that that's the answer to a prayer. Alcoholics Anonymous don't look like the answer to a prayer to newcomers. It don't look like much of nothing, if you really want to know the truth. This is the answer. I mean, we stand here and say, don't drink, go to meetings. What, what do you mean? What, what, about my, what about my court case? Well, don't drink, go to meetings. What? Oh. I remember that day sitting in there. I said, I moved in and I sit down. You know why I came to Alcoholics Anonymous? I came to Alcoholics Anonymous because of the institution. I didn't let women come in there. I came to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous all those years ago to smell perfume. And I've been honking and sniffing ever since. <laughs> I don't know why you come to Alcoholics Anonymous. It's really that important. But I do know if you're through, you're through. And if you're not, you're not. My papa, the father that Alcoholics Anonymous gave me, told me that you can hear when you can hear and you can see when you can see and there ain't a damn thing you can do about it don't make no difference who's talking. I believe that. I moved in and sat down in the back row of that institution on what I lovingly like to call my throne of contempt. I had my coat collar up and my shades on because I was cool. If I'd have been any cooler when I got here, I'd have froze to death for God's sake. <laughs> remember looking up on the backboard and I thought to myself, my God, I wandered into an anti-aircraft brigade. I didn't know what Alcoholics Anonymous was. I said to this guy, what is this? He said, it's Alcoholics Anonymous, John. I sunk down in my seat. Gangsters were not supposed to be hanging out with them winos. There'd been Gangsters Anonymous or Overhip Anonymous or Dope Fiends Anonymous. Oh, oh you, you get in that dope fiend, can't you? Make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Ah, macho. Makes addicts seem kind of candy-ass, don't it? <laughs> if you're going to be bad, you ought to be bad. I thought, well, I'll wait for these women to get up and tell their racist stories. Now, you've got to remember something. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, there weren't very many young pretty girls like Debbie in Alcoholics Anonymous, and if they were, they sure wouldn't send them up that penitentiary where I was at, I'll tell you that. <laughs> These old gals got up to talk that day and said they'd drank for a long time. You could look at them and know they'd been somewhere for a long time. <laughs> they said, I used to drink. I said, I'll bet you did. <laughs> Bad stuff, too. So I knew everything when I came here. I don't know how you were. So I'm a walking encyclopedia of useless information. I know so damn much about what ain't true, I don't know what is true. So I sit there and watch these crazy people. I didn't know what they were doing. I didn't understand people like this. What are they doing? I'd say to myself. What's wrong with these? Some bottom, they're goofy people. You know what they did? They got up on Sunday morning, drove 185 miles up those old back roads at their own expense. 
They spent two hours talking to a room full of people who didn't want to listen to them. Who sit in the back row and made fun of them. Mimicked them. <laughs> you should have quit drinking, Charlie. You know. They puzzled me. And I watched them. And I commented about them. And I mimicked them. And I made fun of them. And I talked to my partners and told them, I'm going to check the winos out today. And one day, because of my curiosity and because of my thing, I asked one of these people, what do you get out of coming up here, anyhow? You some type of sicko who likes to look at the animals in the cages? What's your deal, anyhow? And they looked at me and gave me one of them typical Alcoholics Anonymous answers makes you want to strangle them. Oh, when you can answer that question, you won't have to ask it. I mean, I want something I can get my intellect into, you know what I mean? I mean, that really gives me something to think about. See, I don't understand these type of people. You know why I don't understand them? I'm a taker. Takers don't understand givers. How would a taker understand a giver? I've never seen givers before. I never saw anybody in my life who gave anything just for the hell of giving it. I hung around takers. I hung around users. I hung around violent, destructive people. I didn't hang around people who were given a little just for the hell of giving it. And I didn't know what they were talking about. And so I'd sit in their meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'd sit back there, and, and I'd hear things. You know, I don't know who you are, but newcomers seem to have a selective hearing. You know what I mean? Oh, it comes in here, and it comes out like, oh, that's not what he said, was it? Yes. I mean, you hear things in Alcoholics Anonymous. People say, our primary purpose is to stay sober and carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. And some idiot back here will say, that's not what that means, is it? <laughs> yes, it is. I'm sorry. You know, do you know we have people in this country who are interpreting the book? Yeah, they're trying to figure out what Bill really meant when he wrote the book. They take words and they interpret the words. What do you think Bill meant when he wrote this word, honesty? <laughs> it's amazing. we got a whole group of them out there. You ought to see them, they're weirdos. But they're really neat. For alcohol. They're, they come around and take all of our weirdos out of Alcoholics Anonymous and execute them. We call them born-again AAs out there. Really strange. I didn't know what's going on here. I sit back there in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. These people get up and say, I used to drink, and I don't drink anymore, and everything's wonderful. I guess I'm not alcoholic then. I'm not drinking either, and I'm crazy. <laughs> Wish it was, I'd say. If I could only be an alcoholic, then all I'd have to do is not drink, and I'd be okay. Something far more wrong with me than that, pal. You see, you got to get busy in alcoholics and I was I equated busy with being in motion. I did not know what they were talking about. I thought being in motion was being busy, moving fast. See, I learned in my neighborhood, moving targets hard to hit. And so I picked up ashtrays and poured coffee and smiled at folks. <laughs> Went back there and set an inventory point and died. I'm doing what you told me, doing crazy. And every time you ask any of these people anything, you know what they tell you? It's in the book. What's in the book? Oh, it's there. You go look for it, you'll find it. You know, I discovered something since I've been sober. I discovered if you want to hide anything from an alcoholic, put it in the book. <laughs> they don't look there. You know why? Two or three reasons anymore. Thinking. <laughs> There's no chapter deals with issues. Stop a lot of them. And there damn sure ain't any chapters that deals with healing the wounded inner child. Do you know what the book Alcoholics Anonymous really is? It's a set of spiritual principles. When practice as a way of life dispels the necessity to have to drink alcohol. That's all it is. Anything any more intelligent or soul-seeking than that. 
But I think the key word is practice. Practice, I guess that's why people like me, after all these years, still got to go to four or five meetings a week, still have to have a sponsor, still got to go to book study meetings, got to study the steps, the tradition, got to do all this. I guess that's why, because it says practice it. My defiance, much like Rochelle's, is why I'm alive and well and sober today. Not because of my intellect, or because I'm smart, or because I'm any one of God's chosen kids. My defiance is why I'm alive and well and sober and Alcoholics Anonymous because you kept telling me it's in that book and I'm going to work your program recovery to prove you I'm different that this program won't work for me. That's what I'm going to do. And the greatest single event that's ever happened to me in my entire lifetime, bar none, being born, coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, getting sober, staying sober, my children being born, my grandchildren being born. The greatest single event in my entire lifetime that I can remember in my lifetime happened to me in a room with a man doing what our program recovery says is the fifth step. I heard myself admit to this man that I was an alcoholic. And from way down deep inside of me there came a freedom that I carry with me this very instant. I know what's wrong with me. I'm an alcoholic. I suffer from a disease called alcoholism. I'm not an alcoholic and anything. When I was an alcoholic and something or other, I could not have your program. And the reason I couldn't have it is I separated me from you. I was not like you. When I became just like you, alcoholic, I got a practice to the best of my ability, which is sometimes very limited. The only program of recovery for people like me that's ever been incorporated in 4,000 years of recorded history of alcoholism. Program of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's the only thing that's ever worked for people like me. I believe, not, may be purely a selfish motive or selfish belief. But I believe the program of Alcoholics Anonymous in its entirety in the book, at least the first 164 pages of it, were written for alcoholics of my type. People who can't live sober. People who have to have some type of a spiritual or a, some type of an awakening of a spirit within them before I can live comfortably in my own skin without the Necessity to add something to calm down the madness inside of me. I believe that. I believe it with everything that I know that I believe in. I believe that. And the reason I know that is, is because I find me in every single thing that's in that book. I'm sitting in the back row of a meeting in Alcoholics Anonymous in a penitentiary a long time ago. And a little guy that I knew who's dead now, a guy that was my baseball coach when I was a star second baseman for the San Quentin Pirates. You ought to put that on your resume and get the eyebrow braid sometime. <laughs> Came into this institution I was in and stood at a podium like this and told me something that all the great intellectual people and psychiatrists and sociologists and criminologists and penologists that had been working with me for 20 years never seemed to know. He said to me, you don't have to live this way no more if you don't want to. You don't have to do it like this no more. And after the meeting, I asked him. I said, how do you learn to live, Les? How do you learn to live like that? He said, the answer to any question I may ever have in my lifetime lies between the covers of the book called Alcoholics Anonymous. And that. It's true. I find that to be true. And I came out of that penitentiary on the fourth day of June, 1961. But something that happened to me when I walked out of that institution to the best of my ability with the exception of maybe one or two names on my list I had completed and fulfilled the first nine steps of our program recovery I know that I'd had people set me in rooms and word by word sentence by sentence paragraph by paragraph feed me the English language they told me that things like cussing was a crutch for conversational cripples I was taught by people who loved me a great deal I was taught by people who loved me enough to stand my wrath when they corrected me. 
That's what love's all about. Love is not about overlooking and making allowances and putting up with. Love is all about correction. Love corrects. Everything else short of that corrupts. I know that. I know it because I've been loved to the point I am right now by the people who love me by telling me what I'm off base. I came out of that penitentiary, I knew nothing about the world or the thing in it. I had no social skills. I knew nothing about living out in the world. And I was fortunate enough to run into a guy in a penitentiary by the name of Norm Alpe, who became my sponsor. And he was to guide me through life into things that I didn't know. And the first thing he told me was, go to work. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, work, W-O-R-K, go to work. He says, you're a bum. I said, wait a minute, Norm. Let's get this straight. I'm not a bum. He said, what are you? I said, I'm an AA member. He said, you're an AA bum. <laughs> Bums don't work. Go to work, bum. So he got me an interview with a guy that he did some business with in the oil field. And I showed up down there to get a job. And the guy asked me what my social security card number was. I said, what's that? He said, you don't have a social security card? I said, no, I don't. He said, how old are you? I said, I'm 30. He says, my God, man, where have you been all these years? I said, you wouldn't understand if I told you. I never need a social security card. Why do you need a social security card if you don't work? I stole my money. Norm used to have a great saying. I was a thief by trade. I was an alcoholic by consumption. <laughs> it's true. I never earned anything. I stole and used and took and did everything that was necessary to earn a lot of money out there. Because I thought money was the answer to everything. I know all about money, property, and prestige before I ever got here. Ain't got nothing to do with it. Sit up there in one of them penthouses with a closet full of $300 suits and three or four big automobiles sitting in the garage and people calling you all hours, night and day, and begging you for favors. And you're so frightened you can't even leave your closet. Money, property, and prestige. <laughs> Pray somebody to take your money while you're gone. I went to work. And I didn't know what you do when you go to work. But I went to work anyhow because Norm said to. And whatever Norm said, I did. Didn't like it. But I always did what Norm said. Because you know why? I knew I didn't know how. I didn't know, and I still know, I don't know. Norm knew. I knew he knew, but I knew I didn't know. So I did what Norm said to do. I didn't like it. I had a secret dream. I, you know what I always knew way down? I never told him, but I always thought this every time he browbeat me or yelled at me. I thought he's just jealous because I have a better story than he does. <laughs> and he's trying to keep me down. You guys really understand, you know, my, I wasn't wrapped up too tight coming out of that penitentiary, I tell you. First thing he told me, I'm 19 months, I'm 19 months in the alcoholic I was in the penitentiary, and I come walking out of the penitentiary, and I'm big, I'm big man at the club. <laughs> 19 months, a lot of time down some of them Milano clubs, see. You sit around and talk philosophical and tell them how bad you are, and you know, this, Norm says, how long have you been sober, hot shot? And I said, 19 months, Norm. He says, oh, no, you haven't. This is your first day of sobriety. What? He says, yeah, in there and out here. Boy, how wise he is. It's true. 19 months and destroy me. So I took my birthday cake from the day I came out of the penitentiary. Because Norm made me understand a very simple thing. My problems weren't penitentiaries. My problem was living out there in the world one day at a time without a drink of alcohol or a moved off in the chemical in the system. I had to find out what you do when you get paid. I don't know. Never been paid before. How would you know what to do when you get paid? By this time, my wife would come back and brought that little girl I was never supposed to see. So I used to stand off in the corner of markets and watch people get paid. They come in there with their kids, put them in them baskets and push them down aisles, throw baskets and food and stuff in there. I watched all that. I sit off in the corner and watch and observe. So I finally got a paycheck, my first paycheck. Man, I'm proud of that. I go home, tell the woman, I said, let's go to the market. 
She said, we don't need anything. I said, I don't care. We're going to the market anyhow. <laughs> she says, why? I said, that's what they do when they get paid. She says, who are you talking about? I said, them. <laughs> Have you ever tried to explain them to them? <laughs> I mean, they give you one of them looks, you know. But I guess uh, I had that look in my eye. I can get a look in my eye that reversed me right back to the streets. Chill comes over and we went to the market. We went home an hour later. I went to get some money and somebody stole her purse. You want to hear somebody scream? Listen to a thief when they get stolen from. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, if I caught that guy, you'd have another talker here today. I'd be up there in Folsom with the rest of the losers telling you, hey, it don't work. Oh, yes, it does. That's what the losers tell you, you know. Hey, it don't work. How do you know? How do you know? I had a guy that I sponsored. He's, he's sober three or four years. He's one of them kind of guys that Debbie was talking about Friday night who showed up at the meeting right before it started, took his seat, when A was over, when A man was over, he's gone. Thought his obligation finished when he put his dollar in the basket. After two or three years of this type of behavior, if he's alcoholic, he's got to do what he's alcoholic got to do. He got drunk. That's what he did. He didn't have a slip or a relapse. He got drunk. That's what alcoholics do, you know. They get drunk. They don't have relapses. I'm sorry. I'm just going to speak AA language to you today. I just might throw some of you out the door. But... So he calls me on the phone. Now, I'm, I'm sometimes known as a cruel man in my neighborhood. Johnny, I said, yeah, this old so-and-so, yes, yeah, so-and-so, what do you want? So I'd like to come back to AA. I said, that's kind of hard to come back someplace you ain't never been. He got real indignant about that. He says, what do you mean, man? I went to meetings practically every night for three years. I said to him, well, just because you go sit in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous does not make you a member of Alcoholics Anonymous anymore and go and sit in a chicken coop would make you a chicken. <laughs> and if you don't believe that, go sit in a garage sometime and see how long it takes you to turn into a car. <laughs> it's true. It's very true. I said, I heard Bob explain it last night. There's more to Alcoholics Anonymous than just sitting here and not drinking. Sadly, too many people come to Alcoholics Anonymous today and think the problem's over when they quit drinking. If you're drunk, that may be true. If you're an alcoholic, your problems start when you quit drinking. I don't know when yours started. Mine always started when I came to. <laughs> when I woke up on the floor of that Los Angeles County Jail kicking that last habit, I was in a lot of trouble. Now, prior to that, when I was laying there with my head on my chest, I wasn't in very many problems. When I came to and realized I was faced going back to the penitentiary again, I thought I had a problem. <coughs> my problem <coughs> persists today. Because I'm the problem. I wake up every morning looking at the problem. I am the problem. Not the world, not the things, not the injustice of the world. I am the problem. And being an alcoholic, my solution is to drink. Before I found the thing in my life that did for me what I always believed alcohol should do, but never quite did. It gave me the ability to stand up out there one day at a time and be counted. I used to do a lot of things when I was new in Alcoholics Anonymous, but I always went to a lot of meetings. I used to go to meetings with my sponsor. I'd go to meetings with him. I'd talk to him on the phone. I'd, I'd lay up in the middle of the night, and I'd do things like most newcomers do. I'd scream out in the middle of the night at Norm. I'd say, Norm! He'd say, what do you want, jackass? <laughs> my program ain't working, Norm. Why don't you try ours, he'd say. <laughs> I mean, how do you argue with that? And then, but he would never, even in the middle of the night when he was half asleep and had to go to work, he would always finish the statement. 
He'd say, Jackass, your program never did work. It's true. My program doesn't work at all. Ours does. I'll tell you something. If you have a program, it doesn't work either. If your program works, why are you, what are you doing in an AME? Our program work, it's the only thing that's ever worked for people like me in 4,000 years. That's why I'm here. I'm not here because I'm wonderful or tried to save Huntsville. Huntsville needs saving, that's for sure, but I can do it. Man. I mean, sometimes it's what an order I can't go through with it, you know what I mean? I, would, I, I, had some, I had some great... Tea. Alcoholics Anonymous has given me many things. It's given me a family that I never had before. It gave me an old man that I love more than anything in the world. Who was the only father I've ever known. I loved him, God, I loved him. He taught me many things. The greatest thing he ever taught me, there was not a damn thing special about me just because I'm sober. He taught me that I'm not chosen. He taught me that we're not chosen. He gave me a God of my very own, a God of my very own, not, not somebody else's concept of a God, not my grandmother's God who punishes little boys who are bad. My papa gave me a God that the rain falls on the just as well as the unjust. Who am I? What kind of an egotistical trip would it be for me to stand here and tell you that God favors me over somebody else and then we're all God's kids? What kind of an egotistical trip would that be for Christ's sakes? I couldn't buy that concept of God today anymore. I could buy it when I was a child at my grandmother's knee. My God loves everybody. Everybody. We're all God's kids. That's what Papa told me. I believed him. I tried to convince him that I was chosen because my ego wanted me to believe that I was chosen. Papa said, you ain't chosen. Forget it. He said, if you were chosen, the book wouldn't say that the rain falls on the just as well as the unjust. It would say it only falls on the just. What about the guy laying over the corner, he said? You any more God's kid than you? What about the thousand people who will never come to Alcoholics Anonymous and get sober, who need this program as much as I need as much as you? What about them? What about the hundreds of thousands of people who will never be blessed with sitting in our meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and know what we've known this weekend? What about them? Do you any lesser God kid than I am? I don't believe so. I just buried my little mother. Funny how role reversal go. For six weeks, my mother died. I was with her every day. My little mother never got sober. I'm more chosen than her. I will never in my lifetime be a good as person as my mother was. Ever. Never will I ever be as good as her. And yet I'm sober. I'm the only person in my whole family who has ever known the joys of Alcoholics Anonymous. The joys. This is the easiest thing I have ever done. It's the only good life that's ever been mine. Alcoholics Anonymous. And I've treasured above all things. I was in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I hear things in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is great me. I was in a meeting with Norm one night. And Norm had the other meditated thing to pull me back into my center. I was at a meeting when I was Norm and I'm at the literature table at the coffee break hanging out with some of the better members discussing things. And this guy looked at me and he said, Gee, Johnny, you sure are a miracle. And I looked at him and, you know, Oh, really? He says, Oh, yeah, man. He says, I, I know your story, man. You're a miracle. God, he said, you really are a miracle. Really? <laughs> and I just kind of floated on the back of my seat, sat down by Norm, looked out the window. He was talking, he was looking at me, and I'm... We're going home on the freeway that night, and I'm staring out the window, 
to my home up there somewhere. <laughs> and Norm looked at me and said, what's the matter with you, jackass? <laughs> You've been smoking that stuff? What the hell's wrong with you? I said, Norm, I'm a miracle. <laughs> he damn near ran into the divider stopping the car. He said, you're all what? I said, I'm a miracle, Norm. He said, where do you get this insane stuff at? I said, I just, just heard it back there at the coffee table. It's true. I'm a miracle. He said, jackass, you're not a miracle. Alcoholics Anonymous is the miracle. You're just a small part of it. You see, I don't know what that does for anybody else. I don't know what that kind of instruction would mean to anybody else. You know what it's done for me? It's kept me small enough to stay here. I have enough trouble staying small enough to stay here without believing that I'm a miracle. God, if I really believed that, I'd be standing out there on the corner with a sign saying, I'm a miracle. <laughs> Come into my tent and bring donations. <laughs> Miracles need to be seen. I would do things like that. That's the type of ego I have. That's the type of self-centered, self-serving egotism that possesses me even though I haven't had a drink of alcohol or moved off in chemical in all these years. So I have to keep coming back to me. I'm not well. I haven't gotten good here. I know some people have. More power to you. But just not be so damn good that we're no earthly use to anybody. I had an old gal that I used to love in my neighborhood got sober about the same time I did by the name Ruth Mathis. Ruthie was a lovely old lady. She said there's only about six inches difference between a halo and a noose. <laughs> True. Many, many significant things have happened to me since I've been sober. What you've given me is probably the most priceless thing that I know of. It hasn't been the easiest year of my life. Last four or five months haven't been the easiest four or five months of my life. I've had to make decisions that I didn't want to make. I had to make them anyhow. But I tell you something. When my little mother died out the last thing she saw on the face of her. And I loved her. I sat there and hugged her and kissed her in the forehead and told her I loved her right before she died. Somebody I hated all my life before I came to you. Wouldn't it be a terrible tragedy if I'd have said in some of these so-called healing things and blame my mother for everything that happened to me? Wouldn't that be a sad, sad thing to have to live with that type of predicament, with that type of resentment the rest of my life? I drove halfway across the United States to walk into a beer joint to make amends to a derelict sitting on a bar stool who was the man I hated most in my life, my father, and told him I didn't hate him no more. And the last little piece of acid that he hate went out of my system and has never returned. I don't hate anything. I don't like a lot of things. I don't approve of a lot of things. But I don't hate anything. And what I've gotten today, probably more than anything else in this world, I learned, I've learned something here. I've learned how to love you. I love you very much, you know. I don't believe in that thing. I had to learn to love me before I could love you. That's, that's possible. I'd never be able to do it because there's times I don't even like me. But I've never not loved you. Never in my life have I not loved you people of Alcoholics Anonymous because you're the people who came to me and rocked me to sleep when nobody else would have spit on my grave. And I have never forgotten that. That's why I come to you. That's why I come and sit in your meetings. That's why my phone number is listed. That's why if the date's open, it belongs to you. That's why I keep doing the things I do in Alcoholics Anonymous. Not because I'm good. Not because I'm perfect. Not because I don't make mistakes. Not because I'm not guilty about things. I come here because it's seemingly to me that I owe every living thing in my life to you. I never felt 
anything before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous but rage. And since I've been here, I've learned to love. I've learned to respect. I've learned to care. I've been a given a God of my very own. Jesus, how a fortunate can a man be? A tongue-chewing, babbling idiot who crawled around in the cell, drifting in and out of total insanity, who able to stand and look at people and tell them how much he loves them. Isn't it amazing that the paradoxes in Alcoholics Anonymous are not what you seem to hear? I've forgiven you a long, long time before you ever forgave me. I forgave my father whether my father ever forgave me or not. I forgave my mother and learned to love her. I sit and watch the old man that I love more than anything in the world die of emphysema. And I sit there and rocked him to sleep. I told him that I loved him and took time out of my busy life to go visit him. You gave me that. You gave me every living thing I have in my life. Every living single thing that I have in my life I owe to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Everything I may ever hope to have in my life I will owe to Alcoholics Anonymous than you. And dear friends, you better believe this this morning. It's a long, long walk from a cell in solitary confinement at a maximum security penitentiary to where I stand right now. But for the grace of God, AA and good folks like you, I could have missed it all. God bless you.